please welcome Elsa. Thanks so much for that, that kind introduction. All right, let's see if this is all working. So the thing that I wanted to come talk to you about today uh, is sort of a new kind of health. There's been a lot spoken about in terms of the Internet of Things, um, about wearables, and I want to show you some of the things that I think it can do. So in every generation, we sort of have a major inequality we face. For my grandparents' generation, uh, it was... Uh, sort of gender equality, although we're still sort of fighting that, that battle today, uh, it's, it's now obvious. For my parents' generation, it was race equality. Um, for my generation, it's been uh, sexual orientation equality. It was only last year that uh, people of the same sex were able to get married in my home state of California. So all of these things, there's some sort of equality that in retrospect, or inequality that in retrospect is, is obvious, and the big question I have for you is what is that inequality for our children's generation? And for me, I think it's health. There's health inequality, the health haves and the health have nots. So in the US, by 2020, so that's in just a couple years now, six, 52% of Americans are predicted to be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Now, that's a really scary number. That means a kid born today, by the time she's in pre-kindergarten, not even just kindergarten, but pre-kindergarten, one of her two parents will be diabetic. One out of three U.S. citizens are obese, and three out of four are overweight. And it's not just a problem in the US, sort of if you sort of break down the world as a whole, half of the world is overweight and the other half is starving. It's sort of depressing. I mean, there is both great tragedy and great opportunity here. And it's not a moment in time. This is a problem which is accelerating. So let's, let's move out of just a very US-centric view and come over here to, to Europe. This is Netherlands. Um, childhood obesity from 1980 to 1997 doubled. And from 1997 to 2004, doubled again. This problem is getting faster. So let's review. If we go back 100 years, the kinds of things that killed us were them, things outside of us, things like the flu, or pneumonia, tuberculosis. And doctors have actually done a really good job at helping us be able to survive those things. So what kinds of things kill us now? Well, it's actually it's sort of depressing, but it's us. The top five killers and the top five costs are things like cancer, and obesity, diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease. And the thing that unifies all of these are that they're manageable with behavior change. These are things that we inflict on ourselves. And in the US, one uh, out of two people will be afflicted with these things uh, in their lifetime, and we already saw that just from diabetes. Three out of four dollars spent are for managing chronic disease. These things are the health problems of our time. So the question then is how do we affect behavior change? And what's the solution? So, is it doctors? Uh, and you should always be careful because at least half of your doctors are below average. Don't know if you guys know that. You guys are smarter than US audiences. They never get that joke. Um, so are doctors the solution? They haven't been 
that great in the last little bit at helping us manage our be behavior, um, enabling us to live the kind of healthier lives that, than we want. Um, but I actually think the problem is deeper than that. There's a real crisis going on. So you'd imagine, for instance, that if you went to a doctor uh, with, with a problem, and then you went to a second doctor, the second doctor, by and large, would say the same thing that the first doctor did, you know, second opinion. So a guy named John Ioannidis, who uh, is a meta-researcher at Stanford, he spends his career looking at now medical research um, and analyzing it, ran just this study. Uh, and here was the, the really scary thing that, so the, the graph here shows uh, the number of doctors um, that agreed or disagreed with the, with the first one after a second opinion. So the second doctor, only 20% of the time said that there should be no treatment change, um, or that is to say, only 20% of the time do doctors agree with themselves. That's pretty scary. If you went to a, uh, to a restaurant um, and ordered something, and then the, you went to another restaurant, and the, the second chef gave you the same thing as the first chef when you ordered, say, a sandwich, only one out of five times, you, you'd be sort of pissed off. Right? So 22% of doctors fundamentally disagreed with the first doctor. They're like, nope, entirely wrong. Another 18% said, uh, yeah, they got the diagnosis right, but they got the treatment wrong. 15% um, asked for more treatment, and 25 said, yeah, this is roughly right, but still, we're going we're to moderately change your treatment. So 80% of the time, the second doctor disagrees with the first. They're like, okay, so maybe it's just doctors don't agree with each other, but at least we can trust medical research, right? So John Ioannidis said, let's take a look. He looked at the top 49 most cited studies, the ones that uh, everyone bases the medical research you all get off of. And you're like, well, if, if peer review science works the way we think it should, we should, of course, see some that are contradicted. Um, but by and large, if the process is working, then the, these cited studies should have been checked and verified, and we should, we should, be, we should feel good about them. And in fact, 20 of them were, so that's great. It's sort of working. But seven of the studies were just directly contradicted later, although they're still cited. Another seven of them were found to have deeply exaggerated claims. 11 of them, this is the one I find scariest, were never verified. And if we know that seven of the top 49 uh, were, were found to be contradicted, another seven were to be exaggerated, that means a big portion of those never verified are just wrong, and yet we still use them. And then five of them were shown uh, to actually have not actually beat the null hypothesis, that they just wasn't useful. So that leads to this amazing sentence, amazing claim, um, that for most study designs and settings, it is more likely for research claim in medicine to be false than it is true. And it's not just him, there's this other great quote, uh, that scientists understand that peer review per se provides only a minimal assurance of quality, and that the public conception of peer review as a stamp of authentication is far from the truth. Now you might think this is a technologist speaking or somebody from Silicon Valley, but you know who said this? This is in nature. So this leaves us in a crisis-filled moment. On one hand, the world health is failing, we're getting worse and worse on the chronic disease front, we're fighting obesity, and on the other hand, the medical research that's supposed to be helping us out seems to be a little bit fallible. So what is the solution? What do we do? By the way, this is the thing that got me motivated to come out of sort of Firefox land where I was very happy designing products um, and working with a team that shipped to half a billion people. Like, we have to use this kind of technology to ha start helping to solve the health problem. So there's a guy named Peter Norvig, incredibly smart dude. He runs research uh, for, for Google. And he has this, this statement, which I think is incredibly interesting, that data is 10 times smarter than algorithms. And this isn't just a thing that he said, it isn't just an aphorism, although I know that life is too short for aphorisms. Um, 
he looked at all of the, the research around machine learning. And over the course of a number of different types of machine learning problems, showed that if you can increase your data set by an order of magnitude, that is by 10x, then for most types of problems, changing your algorithm doesn't matter if you can increase your data set uh, size by 10. I had a little more time, I'd actually walk you through it because it's incredibly fascinating research. And so when you start thinking about health and medicine in terms of data sets, this no longer should be surprising because most uh, health research is done with dozens of people, maybe 50, maybe 100. The really big ones are done with a couple hundred, a couple thousand. And we need to be, for things that are as individualized as our body, at the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people scale. Since the 1980s, we've seen that the rate of blockbuster drug discovery has been falling. Why? Because we're just, we're all very different. We've already found all the ones that work for all of us. So that means that if we really want to tackle these problems, that behavior change is the next blockbuster drug. And the only companies, the only people that have ever been able to successfully change behavior at scale are consumer companies. So I now work at Jawbone, um, and we make the Jawbone up among a number of other things like speakers. Um, and what's cool about this is that it tracks you, I guess it's a little scary, but it tracks you uh, at 30 hertz uh, for as long as you wear. And we try to make these things which are seamless and blend in with your life so that we can take data and to analyze it. And the idea here is that we put you at the center. So, you know, we've heard about the Internet of Things. We really about think about this as the Internet of you. Um, because data, all that data that's collected is sort of useless unless it's turned into meaning. And meaning is useless unless you can act upon it. So you can think about it as the Internet of you or the Internet of meeting. We have to turn data about you into something that can help you change your behavior to kind of live the kind of life that you want. We have to be able to do this at scale to try to tackle these huge behavior issues. So I want to focus just on one little area, uh, and that area is on sleep. Um, so one of the cool things about but the, the data coming off of the up, um, you know, it does things like it can, it can wake you up in the right time of sleep because it tracks sleep, uh, and it uh, will track how much you, you move. Um, but that sleep part, I think, is really interesting. Uh, and we actually do the world's largest sleep study, and we do it every week. Um, I think we've now collected over 50 million sleep nights. Um, and what does that let us do? Well, it lets us answer some really fundamental problems um, or questions and then start to do some really cool stuff. So here's a question for the audience. Who do you think sleeps more, men or women? Who thinks men? All right, around a fifth. And women? <laughs> here's the answer. Correct, women. Um, and they sleep around 20 minutes more, it turns out. Um, and so we knew this was sort of anecdotally true, and we've seen it a little bit in research labs, but we were able to find a whole bunch more about sleep um, when you have you know, millions of devices out there. Um, as you can see, this is sort of neat, that as people hit 20 years old just as they go to college, they actually, you'd think they'd get less sleep, they actually get four minutes more sleep. Um, we call it the freshman four. Uh, over time, actually, the gap between men and women sort of goes down, uh, and you can see just as you hit retirement age, men, at least in the U.S., retire a little bit later than women, you can see that they start sleeping a little bit more. So that's sort of cool. We did something that, again, has never really been able to study at scale. Um, we looked at the difference between, uh, or the effect of sleep and BMI and gender. So once again, you can see that 20 minute gap between men and women. Um, but now you can see 
that if you're incredibly light, sort of malnourished, uh, men and women, like the difference sort of drops. You just don't sleep, or you start sleeping a whole bunch. Um, but the heavier you are, the worse you sleep, which I guess is a little obvious, but it's amazing to be able to see these results quantized and know exactly what that difference will be. You can start understanding how people uh, consume. So one of the things, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but you can start seeing how people drink caffeine by the, by the hour. And this is over, I think, si over six million cups of, of coffee um, or <coughs> caffeine drinks. Um, so you can see this sort of the iced tea thing right there in the center. You can see coffee drinkers starting. You can see the energy drinks drunk by college kids way in the mornings. Um, so this is cool. And in fact, one of the things we just released was a thing called Up Coffee, which lets you uh, track your, your sleep and your caffeine consumption. And this is the first time that I know of that we were able to show uh, exactly what caffeine does to sleep. So for every 100 milligrams of caffeine consumed, we can tell you how it affects your sleep. Do you wake up more? Do you wake up less? So it's starting to get exciting. This is the first time I've seen sort of quantified self starting to answer the real questions that we have. Um, but all of this stuff is, is sort of at the very beginning. We're starting to understand ourselves uh, with data. The real question is, can we affect behavior change? Um, so we ran a study fairly recently with 40,000 participants. Now, mind you, normal sleep studies, the, I just read a, a big one, it had like 12 people in it. So we sort of decided to make it a little bit bigger, we went to 40,000, um, and we sent people an intervention. We said, hey, um, we know that behavior change starts very small, so we're gonna start with the behavior change of like, get to sleep a little bit earlier tonight. We sent the right message at the right time in the same way that when you do searches on Google, um, they show you those little ads, and you're more likely to click on them because they've caught you at a moment of intentionality. So we did that, um, and we got people to commit. And all they had to do was say, opt in and say, yep, I will sleep. Um, and because we sent the right message to the right person at the right time, we were able to get each person to sleep 23 more minutes that night. And in fact, they were 72% more likely to hit their sleep goal for that night. Now, you might think 23 minutes isn't all that much, um, but there's this other cool thing uh, that we found in the data. So we looked at the difference between people that slept seven hours or more and people that slept, in, slept seven hours or less. And what we found out is that the people that sleep seven hours or more are 15.9% more likely to say when they wake up the next day that they had a really energetic day, they felt energetic. And were 24% more likely to say that they felt beautiful. Which is sort of cool. Um, so, do you know who in Europe gets the least amount of sleep? Which country? Clocking in at only an average of six hours and 56 minutes? In, in Europe? Switzerland, in Japan, Europe. Um, hmm. So it turns out Germany. Yep, you guys sleep the worst. <laughs> you worked a lot. <laughs> Although, yeah, it turns out that France wakes up the latest and sleeps the most. Um, <laughs> but hey, this is true quantified data. We know this. Um, so anyway, so you guys sleep six hours and 56 minutes on average. Just 23 minutes gets you above so that you can all start looking more beautiful. Um, so anyway, I'll make a prediction. So this is just like the very, very beginning of behavior change, right? We have data. Um, we're not the only company, but Internet of Things starts like, and wearables really start giving us a new realm of data to explore on top of which we can help people change their behavior. Um, we're just at the very, very beginning. Um, I've shown you some of the stuff we're working on, but here's my prediction. In the next 20 years, doctors will start becoming data scientists, just ones that happen to have
great bedside manners. So what's the solution to this health crisis? Well, I think it's the data collected, behavior change made manifest by having the Internet of View uh, sort of at the center. So that is the future of health and the new kind of health. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Let's sit down for a second. Thank you, Isa. Um, why at all did you quit your job at Mozilla and become a health researcher? You, did, you, you had one of the best jobs in the universe. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was an amazing job being able to sort of ship product out to, to work on something that was public benefit, not for profit. Um, it was a really heady thing to be able to do it as, as like a 24, 25, 26 year old. Um, for me, at that point, uh, I was looking around for the kinds of challenges um, and kinds of problems that design could have an outsized effect in. Um, and it wasn't going to be another photo sharing site. Uh, it wasn't going to be another social net. I wanted to do something that, that could affect the world. Um, and when you look around, they're like, well, what are the big problems? It's, it's education and it's healthcare. I have no idea how to make money in education. Um, but in particular, healthcare, like th there's a reason why you've never heard enjoyable and doctor's office in the same sentence together. <laughs> And it's because we had never sort of applied that kind of consumer technology think in health. Um, and so there's great opportunity there and a great opportunity to do great good. Um, my hope when I started my little company, Massive Health, the one that eventually got, got sucked into to Jawbone, was instead of having the brightest minds in Silicon Valley focused on, you know, distracting you and getting you to look at an ad, um, and productizing you. Instead, we could help galvanize those smartest minds to come work on these problems that really matter. And those are things like health. Mm. But why is it so hard to do these things like, you know, your wristband here, which is basically one sensor measuring um, something? Why, why don't we have 10 sensors m measuring everything uh, around our wrists? It's, really, so? it's a good question. So these things, um, you know, it turns out are actually really hard to make. If you want to have something that can work with you, uh, be with you 24-7, they can go through a shower, like that's, and have a little computer on it, like that's not a solved problem yet. Um, so, I mean, go another 10 years out, and I think you'll see that the, the sensors have been commoditized. Like this, as a band, will be great for a user experience, but your shirt will have data coming off of it, your shoes will have data coming off of it, your refrigerator will probably just yell at you still. Um, so you, you start by making products that work around people's real life. And over time, you'll see that those kinds of sensors and the data coming off it will get richer and richer and richer. Um, but that's not the really interesting thing. The really interesting thing is what you do with that data once it comes off. And that's how do you turn it from just data into meaning. Hmm. But so there's a big discussion about, well, the, this early generation of wristbands and sensors that they just measure something, but it's not co correlated to my reality. So there's a famous blog entry at the New York Times where two guys walk through San Francisco and uh, with, with, uh, with some wristband and they end up with uh, a gap of 10,000 steps in their statistics. So it, it's, it doesn't correlate to, to nature yet, what you measure. Is that correct? Hmm. So, what I think really matters, so we've had the exact same kinds of um, sort of challenges, say, around measuring sleep. Um, so, hmm. you know, when you look at the kind of sleep that this thing measures, um, it essentially measures whatever your motion is, right? Um, and it, there's an idea of deep sleep in... Uh, in sort of academic research, and it, it's about a particular brain state. And what we said is that, you know, what really matters is less exactly how it correlates to current medical research, 
But what really matters is how it affects you in a way that affects your life, right? Mm. Like, does it help you feel more beautiful? Does it help you feel more energetic? Does it help you feel more focused and productive? These are the things that real humans care about, not what their brain waves were mm. doing last night. Um, I mean, that's a good proxy, but it's that human element that really mm. matters. So I think here, it's, it's almost a red herring to think about um, the data in terms of accuracy to a gold standard which doesn't reflect on the human right. state. That's the thing you have to focus on. Do people already change their behavior? Can you see that in your data? Yeah, I mean, you, we saw some of this yeah, already. Yeah, yeah. So do they really change in the long-term periods or do they just quit? So a lot of, so I quit. I, I owned all these, these wristbands and I just don't use them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I mean, we're at the sort of the early stages here. Mm -hmm. Like to me, this band, while it's amazing, is sort of like the, uh, the cell phones from the 1980s. Mm. Um, okay. They're, they're super useful, they're great, um, but we're at the first couple of generations. Uh, and we're still figuring out, like, how do you really engage with people around health, not just for months, but for years? It's an unsolved problem, and it's an exciting one. Mm. I was wondering if you're talking a lot to Apple these days. So there's the 2nd of June, I think, where they may show their new eyes uh, with something called Health Book, but it's all rumors built into the, the operating system. So do you talk to these guys? I mean, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a magic eight ball that we could look into and see what it Apple does? Just call does. Apple. It's, yeah. it's, uh, uh, it, um, although we sort of have magic eight balls that tell us what Microsoft does. I think you shake and they say, Outlook, not good, right? <laughs> um, that said, I mean, so you know, we've, we've seen a little bit about um, sort of Apple starting to, to think about these things. But for us, you know, if or if they don't get into the game, but if they do, this is great because it's just validation for the fact that this field is an incredibly exciting and important one. Mm. But we see that, so Apple is working on this, rumors, working on this for years now, and there's no product yet. So it seems to be really, really, really hard to measure something valuable. In, with, with consumer products, we're not talking about, you know, doctors, mm -hmm. devices, but things you wear all day. Why is it so hard? Remember, it's not just about measuring. Measuring is the beginning. You have to have data so you can do something with it. But on top of that comes you know, that meaning that you get. On top of that comes that social layer and that social stack. Because right now, you know, to, to give an analogy, um, if we think back to Flickr. Uh, Flickr mm. was incredibly bold at the time that it was launched because they switched the default to share um, to be on by default, right? They said, most of your photos actually should be out in the world. But back then, you know, people said, why would you want to do that? You'd, you, you, you wouldn't want to do that. Most of your pictures are pictures of your kids. The pictures of your family. Do you really want to slit, sit through yet another slideshow of somebody else's vacation? No, of course you don't. Um, but yet, they launched. It was incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave direct birth, I think, to things like Instagram to Facebook, to all of these social platforms. Now, when you look at it in health, right now we think of our health data um, as something which is incredibly private, right? It's about mm -hmm. you, you only want maybe your, like, your very close loved ones to see it, but maybe we're thinking about it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about these things like, what is the right social model for health? Um, what are the right ways of getting people to to step into behavior change. These are, are really hard, unsolved problems. Mm. Would it help, so as a user, would it help if we had something like a global API for health data? What I learned is when I used all these products that they don't communicate at all, or, or it's a great feature if one app communicates to another device with, a, with an API. Is someone working on something like that? So we've seen a number of products try, like mm. Google Health, um, and then, uh, the Microsoft uh, Health Vault. We've, we've seen a number of companies try to create just a vault or just a place to put your health data. The problem is that that's not useful. Uh, but it's for designed for doctors mainly, so it's not from the user's perspective. Well, so I want to share my data with my apps and my different devices, not with my doctor. That's right. So, I mean, the Google Health, for instance, was in fact designed mm. for you to put your stuff yeah. in and then share it. Um, but yeah, there, the, you, you articulated the problem exactly, that there wasn't a real strong user value there. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the right way forward, because um, we're still in such early days, is that each company just needs to make sure that the user's data is really the user's and is not right. the company's, and that it's shareable. So for this, uh, the, the up, you know, every piece of information we collect um, is accessible through the API so mm -hmm. that you can pull it off and do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen partners from IFT to uh, Sleepio um, all doing really interesting things on top of that data. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you so much.